Okay, I think that's my, my fair and equitable two minute grace period. We'll kick off. So welcome to this webinar by Six Clicks on better managing your defense industry security program requirements with technology. You may already be a DIST member, but if you aren't, we will touch on the requirements briefly, but we won't dwell on them. They are what they are. Uh, the real focus of our session today will be on understanding the pitfalls of relying on spreadsheets and Word documents to manage compliance to DISP, but it could be any other set of compliance obligations as well. And we'll explore the benefits of leveraging technology. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Robinson. I'm one of the founders here at Six Clicks, as well as our Chief Information Security Officer. Got a fair bit of experience in, in government and industry, uh, and we at, at Six Clicks also participate in this program. It looks like uh, we've got a good audience uh, on Zoom and, and via LinkedIn. Uh, so I'd like to firstly start by introducing uh, my esteemed panelists. We've got uh, firstly, Aaron Pollard, Managing Consultant of the Protective Security Division at Cyber CX. Aaron is an experienced and business oriented security professional with more than 20 years of experience in all aspects of government and defense, security, supply chain risk management. And Aaron has spent about 10 years in national security leadership roles at Airbus and Boeing Defense with roles as such as the agency security advisor in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, PMNC, security advisor to the commander of the First Division Army, uh, and also in the Australian intelligence community prior to that. So Aaron is a passionate to support business through understanding uh, business drivers and, uh, and their priorities and making security business an enabler. Our second guest speaker, uh, thanks uh, Cheyenne Shabir, from, uh, uh, from Nova Systems is the Director of Security and Technology and CIO there. Nova Systems is a global engineering service and technology business headquartered out of Australia. Nova provides its expertise across defence, aviation, essential services, government, and as I found out recently talking with Cheyenne, also space, which is certainly very cool, or at least I think so. Uh, prior to his current role as CIO and CSO, Chief Security Officer at Nova Systems, Cheyenne did a stint at Alinta Energy, and before that, the Australian Health Practitioner Re Regulation Agency. So you can safely say that Cheyenne is familiar with government, defence and industry requirements, and he knows how to best manage compliance to them. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining us today on our uh, panel. Can you please say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting, uh, Andrew. Our pleasure to host this uh, session and, and share information with all those attending, wherever you are in the world, mostly Australian, but maybe also some people tuning in from overseas. I just wanted to start with a little bit more context for first timers, uh, if there is uh, any on this call. The Defence Industry Security Program, or DISP as we call it for short, is a security program for Australian businesses currently working with the Australian Department of Defence or, or maybe seeking to be a partner in the future. Uh, the program's purpose is to ensure that those member organisations understand and meet their security obligations when engaging with defence on projects, contracts and tenders. Naturally, information associated with defence projects is official information and much of it even classified in order to protect the confidentiality of that information, which if compromised could really result in a reduction of Australia's national security on a military basis and may have knock on effects that stem as far away as impacting the country's political, diplomatic, economic, and even social well being. So, Aaron, maybe if I could get things started with you, move on from my voice and on to someone new. Uh, I know you're, you will get, we're going to focus on a lot of the details later on and, and go off road, but for those that aren't familiar with this, maybe you can give us a quick high level overview. I will. Thanks, Andrew. And if you'll indulge me for a couple of seconds, I actually just want to do a shout out to a good mate of mine, Lachlan Pierce from L3 Harris. It's his birthday today and I couldn't think of a better birthday present than to give him a DISP webinar. So uh, hopefully he's on the call. He said he was going to be here. Uh, and I promised him that I would do a shout out. So Lockie, happy birthday, mate. Glad you can join us. So 
uh, onto the topic at hand. As you said, uh, Andrew, I'm not going to go into the detail about what DISP is uh, and does in any great extent because we're not really here to talk about that. But um, I'll, I'll cover the high point. So the Defence Industry Security Program is managed by the Defence Industry Security Office. Uh, and if you're not familiar with, or if you haven't kind of picked it up already, a lot of acronyms involved with defence security. So what the DISO does is uh, through the industry security program is supports Australian businesses to understand and meet their obligations, as Andrew said, when engaging in defence projects. Uh, it's essentially, and I, I really like this tagline, it's essentially security vetting for Australian businesses. So we have a vetting process when we uh, put our people through the clearance process if we're involved in the defence industry. And this is essentially a vetting process for the organisation uh, themselves before they become a contractor uh, with defence or to defence. Uh, so it does, there's a number of important outcomes that the, the industry security program generates. Uh, so it helps organisations get the right security requirements when they're delivering uh, defence contracts and tenders. So it's not, uh, it's not designed to be super onerous if you're not delivering or you're not handling classified material. So it's graduated and I'll, and I'll talk very briefly about the, the levels of membership in a sec. Uh, it gives you access to the DISO, so the industry security office. And you can get security advice and support services from them, and they've got offices uh, around the country as well. Uh, one thing it, it does do really well is it helps to understand risk management, not just security risk management, but uh, risk management generally in an organisation that may not be familiar with uh, managing risk generally, having a formalised risk management process. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go and spend millions of dollars on a, on a specific risk management tool. It just uh, introduces the process, like a, a a formulaic standardised process that aligns with the international standard 31,000 for risk management. Uh, and then once you get all that stuff right, it gives confidence to defence and contract managers uh, that your organisation knows you know, what you're doing up to the required level to um, handle any classified material, manage your people, manage your facilities, that kind of thing. So this, this covers four domains, uh, security domains, so personnel security, physical security, uh, information and cyber security and then there's a governance framework that, that wraps around all of that. Uh, there are four, this is where it gets a bit complex, there are four levels of membership in each domain from entry level, uh, level, level one, level two, level three across those four domains uh, and organisations can pick and choose where they want to sit in those domains because you might just want to be in the industry security program because you need cleared staff to provide you know, labour hire services or those kinds of things to defence. So, you don't have to have classified ICT. You don't have to have highly secure facilities. You can pick the DISP membership level that suits you across those domains. Uh, and when it's done properly, uh, as I alluded to before, it's, it's more than just a security program. So it starts building in those processes uh, around governance and in particular risk management, which is a, a key kind of focus of mine, into organisations that may not have uh, a really robust or mature risk management process. So, uh, yeah, it's a... It's a Pretty good place to start. Like it's not perfect. Uh, I, I think we would all uh, agree that there can be, there always can be improvements to, to anything generally, uh, and this is no exception. But um, I think it's it's necessary. We need to have it uh, to make sure that you know small business and large business that are, are contracting to defence and supporting our warfighters uh, have their house in order when it comes to security and in particular risk management. So that's my intro to DISP, Andrew. Perfect. Uh, thanks, uh, Aaron. Uh... Uh, what I like you outlining there is the, the different levels uh, that you can uh, go to for the different domains. And, and that's really going to come down to the type of service or, or product or capability that you deliver to, to defence and mm. um, what makes sense. So very useful uh, information and no doubt people can find out more on uh, the uh, DISP website and we'll link to that in our uh, notes or blog that comes out along with the webinar recording. So uh, before becoming a consultant, Aaron, I know you were responsible for uh, the uh, running Defence Industry Security Program or DISC, uh, DISP uh, programs on behalf of a couple of really big DISP member organisations that we mentioned in your introduction. Uh, so I say that maybe uh, Defence is a bit stuck in its ways in, in that it almost suggests that people would adopt spreadsheets and Word documents to, to manage compliance. I know you might not respond to that to that specifically, but what's been your experience and, and uh, what are the pitfalls that you've seen? So what, what I would say at the outset is uh, probably not Defence being stuck in their, in their ways, but what I would say is that they've got to cater for a broad range of 
of entities in the security program. So you've got to go from the prime contractors, really big, complex multinational organisations uh, who in most cases have their own kind of in-house compliance management systems to a, a greater or lesser extent. And then you're catering to, you know, one, two, half a dozen person, you know, kind of fabrication shops that are supplying key components that, you know, integrators put together and, and deliver into platforms. So they had to try and come up with a, a solution, so a compliance management system, for want of a better expression, that, that was applicable across, you know, from, from the very small business to the very large business. And, and fortunately, it's, it's Microsoft Office, a suite of tools. So um, having, to your, your second question, what's been my experience? I guess they, they run out of office documents, so spreadsheets and, and Word docs run out of the ability to scale very quickly. So if you're dealing with more than one set of compliance requirements, so uh, in my previous roles, managing multiple programs that have slightly different compliance requirements, you end up with 30 different spreadsheets. Um, there, It's difficult to maintain oversight of those. Versioning becomes an issue. And then... Um, obviously data integrity becomes a problem and, and that in itself causes a, a third problem, which is you can't really analyze the data that you've collected because it's, it's all kind of flat. So you've got to try and take data out of a spreadsheet or a Word document and then try and do some kind of analysis somewhere else. So um, it's, you need a, a fairly high level of expertise if you're going to try and do that in spreadsheets. And I'm certainly not the guy that can do that stuff with spreadsheets. So it's, it's highly hiring specialized staff uh, that are, are that are difficult to come by, uh, and then you know try and make some sense out of the data you've collected. So, I guess it's it's okay to a to a point, uh, but once you start getting relatively complex uh, compliance requirements across different aspects of your business, uh, it, it's almost impossible. It's it's just a case of saying, well, I've chucked data in a spreadsheet, and and that's kind of it. Like it's um it's it's far from perfect. Sure, thanks, uh, Aaron. Cheyenne, patiently waiting there to, to come in and join the conversation. Now's your, your time. You are currently the Director of uh, Security and Technology for a DISP member organisation that we mentioned, Nova Systems. What is your take on the pitfalls of working with spreadsheets and Word documents if you've had that experience to manage compliance against DISP? Yeah, so thanks a lot, um, Andrew. I'll just extend on what um, Aaron has just uh, mentioned. Uh, they're definitely uh, you, working with um, productivity tools or office uh, in general. It's it's been working uh, for some time, but I think it gets uh, get complex. Um, obviously, we need to look at uh, multiple levels of uh, clearances or uh, security requirements from this perspective. Um, I mean, I'm lucky to have a really good team who knows what they're doing. Um, on the disk or the defense security side uh, and physical security will look after that. But I think the main thing to note over here is um, those uh, pitfalls where, you know, spreadsheets, you need to keep them updated. Um, security registers, which actually has, is a temp template uh, downloadable from the disk website. Um, it, it's, it constantly needs to be updated and multiple people would need to have access to it. They're single points of failure as well uh, that are created. You know, if there's one spot, fine. Where is the other version? I think that's where, and the, and the more important thing, the trending, how we are tracking, uh, are we compliant to, let's just say entry level uh, or, you know, for a certain office, are we compliant with, you know, ICT or cyber at a level two? So I think the, these things um, matter and now as, uh, you know, this, uh, this or defense has opened up the door to quite a few before it was pretty, pretty much chicken and egg thing. You have to get a this certification to get a contract. And if you want to get a contract, you need to get the this certification. So it, they have made it streamlined, but yes, they, they still need to uh, refine their process, but that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't um, leapfrog them and uh, start working on those solutions, which actually help us maintain our compliance to uh, those uh, those requirements, which are absolutely critical for any organization working in uh, in the area of defense. Hope that that answers the question. It, it does, and we're going to uh, keep moving with this uh, theme and and talk more about how technology can help. We won't uh, linger on on the requirements and the pitfalls of working with spreadsheets and Word documents. I think you guys have 
have, have covered those uh, well. But Sh Cheyenne, staying with you and with your CIO hat on, uh, what are some of the ways in which you believe that technology can, can help and has a notable role to play when it comes to managing security risk and compliance, particularly this, but I guess it could be against any set of requirements? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, it's, it's a remind, uh, call it reminders uh, or uh, the review cycles, that's really important. Um, and uh, we, uh, Aaron would know that we, you know, there's a annual insurance, which reports, which we need, uh, which uh, us uh, um, defense-focused uh, organizations need to uh, deliver as well. Uh, from a risk perspective, it's important that we have it in all-encompassing in sort of one, let's call it platform, which would help us uh, make those right decisions and the risk-based decisions for any compliance side of things and. When you say automated, I think it's sort of semi-automated side of things is when um, auditors come in, they have a ready-made report, which can be sent over to them. Um, it's not emails flying across here and there with um, you know, uh, documents which are management confidence, confidence or FOUO. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very streamlined process to let auditors know that we are serious about sec uh, national security. So I hope that helps answer the question. Oh, it does indeed, uh, Cheyenne, and I'm just typing up some, some notes here around what I'm learning from what you're saying at the same time. So Aaron, maybe if I can return uh, to, to you, I know you're also a champion for the adoption of technology, particularly as it relates to managing security risk and compliance and, and DISP obligations. What are your thoughts on how technology can help? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, you're right. I think um, one of the, the big things that technology enables is better outcomes. So if you do it properly, you'll get better outcomes, you'll save time, uh, and it, simple, it, makes it, it makes it easier to understand your, your risk position, like Shane was talking about before. Um, and on, on, I've had, in previous roles, we've had these kinds of conversations where there's a bit of fear of adoption of technology because people think you're going to try and do them out of the job. Uh, and that's, that's not, there's not the intent of technology and automation. The intent of technology and automation is to free up your people, as Shane said, he's got a, a really capable, um, experienced team. But if they're filling in spreadsheets and Word documents every day, they're not, they're not doing tons of meaningful work. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a very interesting job to come to every morning. And they're not, they're not generating kind of value add work for the organisation as well. So we, we need to free people from this constant administrative burden, and I, and I say burden in the nicest possible way, um, but there's there's admin associated with being a disc member. I think we need to understand that you know in, in that, that that's certainly the case. You can't you can't get away with it. You can't not do it because, as Cheyenne said, you've got to do your annual security report every year. So you need to have some idea about how you're tracking from a compliance perspective, at the end of a 12 month period. So you, you've got to keep your your eye on this. Um, and the intent by using technology is to free up your people to do more meaningful value add work for the organization, not, not fill in forms and, and, and fill in spreadsheets. Um, what that also means is that technology is not gonna fix all your problems. So you can't just buy a black box, plug it in and sit it in the corner and say, I have done security and, uh, and our compliance is done too. Um, it's gotta be the, the right tool for your context and it, it's gotta be configured properly prior to, to rolling it out, otherwise, you know, if you if you get sold a license for something because there's a, everything software as a service now, if you get a license for that uh, particular tool and you're not shown how to use it properly, you don't build it properly from the outset. You're not really going to engage with it, and you're probably not going to renew the license anyway. So it's a it's a huge big cost and a waste of time for everybody. Um, as I said before, technology is not here to replace people. Certainly in this instance, uh, it, it's here to to free up our people from you know administrative drudgery. Uh, if I'm honest. Um, it enables our current staff to perform more meaningful work, as I've said. Uh, and, and, and we've got to get people away from, you know, filling in forms. Like it's, it's, it's not productive. It's not efficient. Uh, it's not, I've, I've, there's no way I would get out of bed thinking, great, I've got eight hours of filling in forms and filling in spreadsheets ahead of me. Cannot wait. Um, the other thing I'd say is if you get the right technology, uh, not only do you get the, the advantages we've talked about just before, uh, if you, if you get the right platform, you're not just managing security risks in the, in the DISP context. We, we should need to be looking, and we should be starting to look, sorry, at a, like an all-hazards approach to risk in our organisation. So that's from, you know, from the top down. Uh, how are we managing things? How are we managing cyber? How are we managing our you know, 
physical security? How are we managing our legal and reputational risks? Like, do we have a do we have control plans in place for these kinds of things? If not, you need to start looking at them. And having a separate spreadsheet for each of those kind of risk domains is is not the way to go. Um, uh, the other thing that if anyone's had any involvement with cybersecurity, you'll know there's a lot of different frameworks around that you can potentially comply with or align with, depending on, on what you need to do. Uh, it, DISP is no different, of course. They use the uh, NIST, DEFSTAN, uh, ISO 27001, or ASD's top four. Now, there are compliance obligations that go along with all four of those, some of which overlap, some don't. Uh, but hypothetically, if you want to do work uh, for the Defence Force here or the, the Defence organisation here, but you also want to uh, start looking at going to the UK or the US, then you've got you've got different compliance requirements that you, you have to meet. And again, you can't run separate spreadsheets for each of those things because it's, it's just not effective. Um, the other part to tack onto that is it, it's okay for you to have your house in order and you might be able to manage that in a spreadsheet. I, I'd argue that the, the opposite is the case. But... Um, how then are you looking at managing the risk your supply chain poses to you? How are you getting a handle on uh, who your key suppliers are, what risk they're posing to you, who their suppliers and potential third parties are, and what risk you're bringing into the organisation by you know, engaging with certain providers? Uh, if a key provider of yours, you know, if a provider of yours falls over and they're critical to you know, your most critical business processes, does that mean that you fall over as well? You, you can't get that kind of a analysis and data out of a spreadsheet. So you've got to have the right technology that's right for your context. Uh, and the, the results can be huge. It doesn't mean you have to spend millions of dollars. You just have to get the right solution for, for your organisation. Can I, can I add something uh, to that, uh, Andrew? Awesome. So that, that's, that's a really great point. Um, so the, 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 the main thing is over here, uh, again, let's, other than national security and security, um, uh, the cost. So if you look at, and let's just say ISO 27001, that traditionally uh, what companies have done is they've stood up an entire project team to do that. That is um, that is a, a humongous task and, and uh, it's a big hit to the pocket as well. So you, you pick up 27001 to or whichever one it is. So it's, it's I agree with um, Aaron that you know, when, when you're looking at it, you, you can't have um, just spreadsheets um, and start start basically syncing them up, which is, um, it's, it's not impossible, but it's uh, quite time taking, I, I would say. And to ma maintain it as well over time, Definitely. As, as the rules yeah. change is, is, is a tricky one. Now, I really like the, those, those points that we're discussing there around maybe there's uh, DISP member organisations that are with us listening or watch the recording that not only do business with the Australian Department of Defence, but they might be looking to get involved uh, with, with allied countries. Maybe they want to get involved um, in exporting their technology to the US or the UK, and there'll, there'll be another whole scheme, be it the CMMC in the US or DEFSTAN, as Aaron mentioned, out, out of the UK that becomes relevant. And that's that. That's where it gets uh, re really uh, tricky and, and having some technology to help you manage those relationships can help. Uh, and of course, I say that as a founder and, and CISO at six clicks, I can say that we, we definitely fall into that category, not exporting uh, to multiple uh, technology to, to, to multiple defence organisations, but just the fact that we accommodate industry, we accommodate gov uh, government and we accommodate uh, defence and defence members means that we need to comply with not only the DISP requirements, but ISO 27001 for our ISO 27001 certification and uh, ISM for our IRAP assessments. And um, we certainly don't use spreadsheets and Word documents for any of that. We use our own, own six clicks platform. So uh, Cheyenne, uh, we've spoken um, increasingly around how technology can help, but I wonder whether you can unpack uh, um, the use of technology with a real world example based on your experience. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll, again, uh, uh extend on one of the points that I made uh, around um, having a, a company which is global and, and Nova System is a, uh, a global company. We've got presence in um, EU, we've got presence in uh, New Zealand, Singapore. So uh, we're going quite quickly and that compliance burden is uh, growing quite quickly as well. So I, I think that that's 
where we have to comply, just to give you an example, I guess, we have to comply with probably seven to eight global uh, defense security standards. So I'm combining all so ISO 27, uh, Cyber Essential Plus, uh, Listex, uh, which is in the, in the more in the UK, which equivalent of DISP. Um, and so well, we we sat back and we said, okay, what do we what do we need to do? We can't stand up, uh, you know, separate project teams to go, and it, it's it's quite time taking. We don't have the expertise, and we don't want to get into that. So what we did was is pretty much um, the concept was a a, a, a a security a common control security standard framework. It is a concept which we um, sort of applied through. Um, a technology a platform uh, and thought, okay, if we make sure we um, comply with these, these, these controls, how would it look like for ISO? How would it look like for CE plus ASD and all that? So to a large extent, we were able to do that. And hence uh, we, we were able to uh, comply with quite a, quite a few standards. Uh, but another, uh, we're going through that um, ISO 27001 um, stage two audit at the moment. Um, we were lucky that we got through stage one uh, without any, well, there were a few observations, but we did uh, easily go, go through it. And that's purely because we were tracking what we are complying with. We are constantly um, having those gap assessments quarterly to make sure, um, you know, we are on top of it. And come stage two, I think things are going well. Uh, we're looking forward to getting the certification, hopefully, but that gives you a better understanding of how important it is to have um, you know, ha have a, I guess, a service solution or a, a, a partner who would continue to help us um, uh, on our, on that journey uh, from a call it technological standpoint as well, uh, what, which we are focusing on, on in this conversation. Does that help, Andrew? Does does indeed. Thanks, uh, Cheyenne. Uh, Aaron, I'm wondering from uh, an industry-wide perspective as a consultant, a uh, you know, former consultant and working uh, with consultants servicing uh, mold multiple industries, multiple customers, is this a, a trend using technology that you think uh, could even escalate uh, and, and, and will be increasingly adopted by organisations and, and, and maybe be um, uh, un understood and encouraged by Defence one day as well? Look, I, I think absolutely, but I just want to touch on a, a point that Shane made. If, if you're trying to, and it was really, really well made, that if you're trying to comply with multiple frameworks across different jurisdictions, you, you, there's almost no point trying to do that in a spreadsheet because, like, I've, I've seen them here when I first started. We have, you know, people spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to map, you know, provisions from, you know, 27,001. So you've got clauses four to 10, then you've got the Annex A controls. Let's try and map them to the ISM so we can get you know, the outcome of the shines being able to generate at NOVA, whereas you know you, you, you answer one question once and then it, it maps back to multiple frameworks. But these are hours and hours and hours of you know mind-numbing labor on gigantic big spreadsheets that that look that are great, you know, now, but they're a point in time assessment. So as soon as the ISM gets updated every quarter, which it does, you know, as as soon as there are some changes to one of the frameworks. A lot of that has to get scrapped and started again. So it's a really time-consuming, you know, labor-intensive process that that you really need technology to, to help solve. Um, so to, to your specific question, Andrew, yes, um, I think if we look at defence industry uh, specifically, then I think the compliance requirements, and we've just seen in the last week uh, an update, another update to the DSPF, uh, strengthening things around uh, background screening for personnel because the Australian Standard 4811 has changed. So if you haven't seen the changes to uh, the DSPF folks, so I encourage you to get out there and find a copy. I think the, the, the updated copy might live on the uh, security officer dashboard. So you might have to have a login to get access to that. But that, you know, that's, that's changed this week. Uh, and I think the, our, our assessment is that the, the security requirements relating to DSPF are, are only going to increase um, because Defence expects you know, more security maturity from its supply chain. And that's a good thing. I mean, we, we should as security professionals you know, we, we should be on board with that and, and not kind of roll our eyes and go, oh, well, you know, what do they want from us now? We need to understand that a rising tide with respect to security maturity lifts all boats. And so we're, we're all in a, in a better position uh, if the, the, the security expectations from defence uh, increase and then you know, our security maturities and in industry increases as well. Um, oh, and you know, AUKUS is, a, is one of the, the, the catalysts for that, but it's not the only catalyst. Uh, and I, I think the 
the, the, as I said, the security requirements associated with being in defence industry as a supplier uh, will, will only increase over time. Uh, I think what we're also going to start seeing in the probably short to medium term is defence prime contractors mandating this membership uh, across their supply chains, regardless of uh, the risk suppliers pose to them or regardless of the services they provide. Uh, I know there's some talk, uh, some colleagues of mine at the, the Chief Security Officer level at, at various primes are talking about it. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. And so well, I think that'll probably be a good thing too, because we've, we've got some, um, there's some, some really good uh, SMEs in particular who do, you know, really innovative, cool stuff uh, for defence who are, who are kind of sitting on the fence now and saying, well, it's not mandatory, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, and I think what that, what that means is that we're not introducing the, the rigour and the, you know, the, the risk management processes and those kinds of things into these smaller organisations, and we really need to. So I think it's only a matter of time before that, that, that uh, this membership is mandated uh, across the supply chain. Certainly from the primes, I don't think defence will, will mandate it because uh, there'll be a little bit of pushback potentially from industry associations. But I think certainly the, the primes will lead the way uh, in, in this, on this front. Um, and you know, they're, they're exposed to a lot of risk. So it's, this becomes a risk mitigation activity for them and, and, and rightly so. And I think if, if you want to be in a, in a defence industry supply chain, then I think you need to demonstrate a certain level of, of maturity. But with the, the compliance requirements increasing, I think it's, it's pretty clear from what we talked about in the, in the last half hour that you, know, you can't rely on the office suite of tools to improve your maturity. It's a case of you know, chuck stuff in and then have a mass panic at the, the 12 month mark when you've got to do your annual security report. So we've, we've, we've got to come up with a better way of doing this. Um, and, and as I said, you, you're not going to be able to try and figure out where you're up to at the, the 12 month mark when, you, when your ASR is due. Um, and you, you don't really want to be, like you don't want to, you want to put yourself in that position. If you're, if you're a small business owner, uh, and I'll use them as the example because they're the ones who can probably benefit the most from this kind of thing. But, you know, technology obviously benefits organisations large and small. You're trying to run a business. You're trying to find people and keep them employed. You're trying to, you know, generate the, probably the business development manager as well. You don't have time to be you know, kind of figuring out at the anniversary of your disc membership, hey, is my house in order and how far back do I need to go to check? So th there's got to be a solution that, uh, to Cheyenne's point previously, allows you to check periodically across the course of the year that uh, your compliance house is in order and spreadsheets are not the way to do that. I think we all acknowledge that. Can I add yeah. something uh, over here? Um, I, I just wanted to uh, extend on a point which uh, Aaron made and very really rightly so. In regards to AUKUS, one of the things uh, which probably uh, would be mandatory, not on for Australia, um, but Working with uh, DOD in the US uh, is the CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Now, uh, they've got, uh, come up with a version two. And if we, if we do it through the spreadsheets, then you know, how, how would you know what the changes are? How would you uh, trend through them? How would you follow through what you have done and what has changed? So I think it, the entire effort uh, to manually go through and quality check that uh, process first is, 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 is quite intense, uh, resource intensive as well. So as AUKUS ramps up, uh, CMMC will be uh, become uh, critical. Probably Australia will start adopting it as, uh, as well. I know uh, we're working in the UK uh, and they, have, they are starting to do that as well. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to extend on that. That's a really good point I made around, um, you know, um, these standards, cybersecurity standards uh, being mandated for, uh, uh, for anybody working in defense. Yeah, I think you're both, both right. There's a, a, two, a couple aspects. There's, there's different standards that might end up applying to you, or, and, and then there's version management of changes to any one standard, um, uh, which which might come your way and you have to find uh, smart and clever ways to handle that. We're here to also talk about technology. So I feel obliged to also mention uh, the role that artificial intelligence can play in, in, in that mapping and organizations should definitely be considering that as well. So what's similar and, and what's different? Of course, Six Clicks has its Haley AI and when we see, see, see that as a technology that's increasingly gonna help compliance professionals like it, it does in, 
in, in many other areas of, of technology and, and threat detection and prevention. So that's definitely uh, one to watch, a technology uh, type uh, and uh, one for another webinar perhaps. Um, so um, Aaron, I'm just moving on uh, to, to a new topic almost. Uh, it's our last topic for the day around uh, partnering. I thought you were well placed to provide an, an explanation to our audience around all, what, what are the options for a DISP or, or prospective DISP member in, in trying to figure out what they need to do and how best to do it. Are there people that they can call on to, to help them? I mean. Here at Six Clicks, we believe in technology. We believe in in content, which is having the easy access to requirements like DISP in a digital format, and ISO and NIST and all the other standards we've talked about. But also access to partners, which can augment technology and have that intimate uh, understanding of the of the requirements. So, um, can you shed some light on that topic? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you, Andrew, in terms of partnering for success. It's, uh, we used to, in a, in a previous role, we used to have these conversations in a, you know, in a big global company uh, when questions like this would come up, so how do we manage our compliance, for example? And we used to have these make or buy conversations. So should we make it or should we go out to the market and, uh, and, and buy a solution? And, and what we saw, unfortunately, was we thought that we were so big that we would just make everything. And you, know, you, you can't conceivably make everything. So you've, you've got to play to your strengths. And you've got to, well, first of all, you've got to understand what those strengths are. Um, and if, if you're in small business in particular, that's probably not understanding the DSPF. So you need to find somebody who understands the DSPF. And you know, just for some fun facts about the DSPF, there's, you know, there's 700 odd pages in it. There's 520 odd control statements um, and unfortunately, I've made a career out of understanding it, so that's how I know those numbers. But you know, you, you shouldn't be expected if you're you're running a business, or like even if you're managing this at, at a prime contractor level, like you, you you probably shouldn't be expected to know all of the details, because there are people out there that do, and you need to rely on those subject matter experts to come and augment your team, because um, it's a lot to take in if you're trying to do other things. Uh, you know, as I said before, if you're a, a small business owner, you're, you're doing the strategy, you're doing the business development work, you're doing the product development work because you want to generate new business. Uh, it, it's too technical to, uh, to try and pick up, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read the, the, a couple of pages of the DSPF before I go to sleep at night. Like that's, that's just not how you're going to get across this kind of stuff because it's so broad. It's, it's so technical. It's, you know, thank goodness I'd say it's becoming a specialty similar to uh, you know, EHS and safety practitioners in organisations, that, that's regarded as a specialty and rightly so. Uh, I think we're seeing protective security move down that path. Uh, certainly cyber security is, which is why we've got, there's a lot of cyber roles and I think uh, protective security is probably the, the next cab off that particular rank to be treated as a specialty because you know, long, long gone are the days when, when you can double tap a facilities person to do uh, your security compliance as well because that just won't fly anymore. You, you'll do it for 12 months and either the person will leave or you'll lose your DISP membership. It's one of those two things that's going to happen. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I think we, you need to partner where it makes sense. Um, and where it doesn't make sense, then, you know, have a crack and try and do it yourself. But what I would suggest for frameworks like DISP uh, and uh, CMMC, like Shan said before, 27,001, uh, you know, even, you know, you, you wouldn't try and pick up uh, compliance with the, uh, environmental standards, say 14,001 or 45001 on your own, you, you'd, you'd go to specialists. Uh, and I think this is a, this is becoming a case where you have to go to, to specialists, particularly if you know, it's not your area of expertise, find somebody for whom it is their area of expertise, and then get the right advice in terms of you know, what you need for your specific context. And that, that's going to be the key. It's not uh, going to a, an external service provider. And we're obviously a contractor, we, we provide these services. To folks all over the place but um I, I would be hesitant to go to somebody who says hey come to us we'll do everything you need to get into our infrastructure we'll sell you a bit of infrastructure as a service uh and you, you're kind of locked in uh what i would suggest is if you when you're having these initial discussions with folks say hey this is what i want to do this is where i want to go uh and I, and I think you're on the right path if somebody says to you well that's great. And, you know, we've had these conversations with clients too, where they come in and say, hey, I, I really want a secret environment because I think if I have my own secret environment, 
I'm going to get more work with defense. It's like, well, have you got a couple of million dollars? Have you got three years? Uh, and they're like, oh, no, I didn't realize it was expensive. Like, okay, so let's talk about what you actually need to do. Like, where do, Where's your business now? Where do you want to go to? And I think if you have those conversations with a uh, with an external service provider, then you're probably on the right track. Uh, if people just want to sell your stuff up front and go, hey, we can do this, for example, um, then you, you, they may be not right for you. But, I, yeah, I, I would suggest talk to somebody who, who, first of all, understands the subject matter and then understands your context and can align the two because a lot of the time that's, that's where the issue is. Sounds like they should just talk to you then, Aaron. Um, so, uh, Cheyenne, I know the defence and defence industry community has been quite insular um, historically or, and uh, opening up and the defence industry security program and how it's been stratified and you've got entry level is, is, is a great thing. What is, what is your view on, on, on partnering as a, as a defence industry member and CIO? Yeah, I think, I think uh, there are various angles to it. And uh, for me, it's more where it makes sense, as Aaron put it. Um, uh, as I said before, I've got a, I'm uh, fortunate enough and privileged to be, um, privileged to have um, a really good team uh, from a defense uh, security perspective, cyber security perspective. Um, so, yeah, and it, 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 when it makes sense to augment that team, yes, um, look at a really good partner, evaluate the uh, right partner who has done it before, has the expertise, because what you're looking for is, I won't call it a small shop uh, yet, but a, a continuous um, continuous relationship. So you're looking at a five-year relationship, really, rather than a just a once-off, uh, because things change. As Aaron put it re- uh, rightly, that you know, one day you'll have you need entry level. The next month or so, next year, you want to up your um, entry levels because of the work that's coming in. So I think for me, it's more um, more around augmenting my current team. Um, and that's where I, I feel it makes sense. But overall, if you know, if you're a small contractor, it makes sense to have a really good, robust partner who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, that, that's that's my view of it. Cool, cool. Uh, thanks, uh, Cheyenne. So that sort of concludes our initial uh, walk through all of the the topics that we intended to to cover in today's panel on uh, uh, the DISP. However, we do have some time for questions and answers. So if you've thought of some, but not typed them into to Zoom or LinkedIn, then uh, please take the time to do that now. I'll just uh, open up the right windows to, and uh, we'll start taking a look at those. You'll see that there's a question here uh, from Tyson ar- around uh, whether Nova and other Six Clicks customers use the platform for management of compliance to other standards such as ISO 9001 quality, 14001 and 45001. So uh, from a six clicks perspective, I can confirm that we, we have that content available in our content library as, as well as what we call control sets, which is recommended ways about going and implementing those requirements as well as assessment templates. So the answer is effectively yes. So um, uh, six clicks is a, a risk and compliance platform that can handle the security standards that we've talked about, but also wider general purpose risk and compliance programs related to quality, safety, environment, business continuity, modern slavery for for your organization. And as Aaron's talked about today, and and we have also across your supply chain, which is critically important. Cheyenne, anything to, to, to add to that? Are you looking at quality, safety and environment at this point or? We are, yes, we are. Uh, so okay. that that that'll be really helpful, um, and and we can take the experience. So lessons learned from what how we have done, ISO, NIST, or uh, CMMC. We're fairly advanced in CMMC as well. So uh, uh, prepping for AUKUS and all. Uh, but yeah, uh, that that is uh, an added benefit, and as uh, the platform grows, uh, uh, in, it's uh, it's evolving uh, in the right direction. Okay, thanks, Shane. Uh, Aaron, maybe one for you, this one. Thoughts on how far in advancing uh, or advance of getting a defence contract you should start preparing for DISP membership? Uh, I will get to that one in a sec. I just wanted to, to address the previous one too. So we, we built an assessment 
in the platform for a client that mapped uh, so a series of questions had mapped back to 9,000, 14,000 and 45,001 in the one assessment. So like we were talking about before, uh, you know, answer one question once, map back to, to multiple uh, you know, standards. So yeah, it's, it's certainly done, we're, we're doing it now. Uh, how far in advance of getting a defence contract should you start your this application? I, look, it depends on which level you want. If you're going for entry level across the board, so you've not got any funky ICT requirements, uh, the, the long pole in the tent for that would be your cyber requirements. So whether you're going to pursue 27001 certification or you're going to demonstrate compliance with ASD's top four, that just generally takes time. Uh, and it, it's a bit more complex the more complex your systems are. Uh, I would say allow uh, six months for, for processing, so to, to get through the application process and then have your uh, application approved. Um, but what I would say too, though, is if, if you're in the final stage of negotiation for a contract, what would really help is if that contract mandated dismembership at a particular level, because that will prioritise your application to the top of the pile. So if you're in the final stages, have a chat to your contract manager and see if, you know, it might, you know, they might say, look, you don't need this now, but in 12 months time, you're going to. Uh, it, it would really help your application now if the, the contract mandated disc membership. Cool, so thanks. That that, it does, I think, Aaron. Um, I've got another question here. Either of you can take it or I'll step in. Is is public DISP training available to upskill existing personnel? I would say, I mean, I, I'm not sure about it, but um, uh, Aaron may have much more in-depth knowledge, but no, from my knowledge, no, because you need to have, um, you need to be a DISP member for your security officers to uh, do that training and that um, because because the nature of content um, it's not public uh, it is uh, more for the disp uh, certified members yeah they did they used to have a series of videos on the website um, that they were the dos are interested in in getting chief security officers in particular to watch before they submitted the application but they've, they've been removed i think that there's there's probably a, a a, a role for somebody. We've got we've got this con content that we built that we can roll out to people. But this this is not a sales pitch specifically for me. But um, you know, it, there are providers around who can run training. But generally, as Shayan said, the the link is made between being a disc member and getting that that con that um, content. Uh, yeah. But it, 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 it's available if you need to. Yeah, yeah. There's probably different types of training. Uh, so yeah, there's the uh, chief information, uh, chief security officer, information security officer type tr training, which I think defence has some stuff available. But then, you know, the, it's not going to uh, necessarily train you up on how to uh, become a DISP member or anything like that. It's just going to give you that general security awareness around um, uh, information security. Okay, cool. A couple more questions coming in on, on Zoom at this point. Does Six Clicks have the capability to replace the security governance register with, uh, I counted it just yesterday, uh, 25 worksheets. And um, absolutely, that's, uh, that's what we do. So I was uh, typing some notes during the webinar, listening to Aaron and, and Cheyenne, uh, and I, maybe I'll, I'll use the time now to give you my summary, which is just to say that uh, you know, the outcomes of the panel today, what I took away was that um, you know, me meeting the DISP program requirements is more than just a one-time compliance-based either assessment or gap assessment, or even a project to implement it. It's more about an ongoing risk management effort and technology has a significant role to play in, in both understanding where you're at and helping to get you to where you need to, um, giving you a central repository to track all, all of the information without spreadsheets and, and Word documents. And, and you've got technology like Six Clicks that's trying to make things easier with artificial intelligence to understand that ov overlap. So uh, definitely, I think these are, these are outcomes that any member organisation and even defence uh, will be looking towards. So specifically for six clicks, we've got a lot of 
out of the box modules, risks, issues, audits and assessments controls that can be used to replace a lot of the worksheets that are in the security register template that's provided by Defence. But you can also create your own uh, registers in six clicks as well to handle any uh, auxiliary information that might be required by the DISP program that isn't available out of the box. And um, there's, there's certainly some interesting registers uh, that you may be required to, to maintain and you can uh, create a home for that in six clicks if you need. So okay. short answer to Bobby's question, Andrew, is yes. So we, yeah. uh, we've we built a disk client template that replicates the security register. So 25 of those are in there. Uh, it, so it does, it does both. Bobby, it, it'll uh, take care of the compliance requirements yeah, around the DSPF. We turn them into uh, a calendar of activities across the year. So, you know, safe combo checks, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they can get assigned to folks, you can set due dates, and you get reminders when they're not done, that kind of thing. So, yeah, absolutely replicate the, the security register, uh, and then we can we can automate the, the control requirements as well. Yeah, so Six Clicks provides the technology and we provide some of the, uh, the content when it comes to this, but um, Aaron and his team at CyberCX build on top of that to make sure that it's perfectly, uh, the configuration of that uh, and, the, and the data is perfectly aligned to, to your needs as well as the DISP requirements. As far as whether the solution's on-premises or hosted, it's a SaaS-based service, but we have uh, a few different environments, in, uh, an industry environment uh, in Australia, as well as the US and the UK and United Arab Emirates, but we also have a six clicks for government solution, uh, which has been IRAP assessed and, and will be again. Uh, and, and that's where we encourage our defence industry uh, security program members and, and partners to operate from. And we also have the capability to, to spin up additional instances if, if required. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we uh, are ISO 27001 uh, certified. We, we've got the IRAP assessment. We're also DISP members. So we do everything we can to, to follow uh, the advice that, uh, you know, well, we, we think other people should follow as well and all of our customers. So hopefully I've answered that question. If you've got any more information, you can reach out to us. Uh, my email address specifically is andrew at sixclicks.com. Uh, more questions, one for Aaron, it seems. Defence is accrediting the first secret cloud service right now. Can uh, foresee? Can you foresee what DISP requirements will remain for a company that moves their secret IT into the cloud, where the cloud provider seems likely to hold much of the DISP responsibility? Yeah, this is a really interesting and timely question, Carl. Thank you. Uh, because we're having these conversations now with ICT security branch. So there's, my take on it is there's not a, a very well developed understanding of how this is going to play out. So uh, what, I, what I've had explained to me so far is that the cloud provider will be responsible for the, uh, I guess, the security requirements relating to their infrastructure but then anything that connects to the cloud environment at the client end will also have to go through the accreditation process. Now, those of us that have been through an accreditation process for a classified environment uh, will understand how long that can take. Uh, I think anything that's kind of laptop based is going to be, if, if that's the, the proposed solution, that's going to be really, really complex uh, and, and challenging to get uh, accredited. Um, because accreditation agencies, in, in, certainly in my experience, uh, are not huge fans of that. And yeah, there are really good reasons for, for them not being huge fans of that. Um, so I think there's more to come in that, in that space, Carl, in terms of who's responsible for what. But what certainly the, the conversations I've had so far uh, look to be indicating that the cloud provider will be responsible for their bit, and then the end user will be responsible for the accreditation requirements are, are around their own infrastructure. Uh, and that, that may mean that you know, um, clients are back to, you know, thin, thin clients on desk kind of thing. So the, 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 the laptop is, is disappearing for the, well, has, won't appear, sorry, uh, for classified work. But yeah, I think what's this space? There's, there's, there's more to come here because I don't think it's a question that uh, the, the accreditation authorities, particularly in defence, have, uh, have a really you know, consolidated answer to just yet because it's quite complex. 
It's complex. Uh, the, the, there is some precedent and uh, information around this that may be relevant um, and feed into the discussion. I and mean, that's the ASD's cloud authorization methodology for, for the systems uh, outside of uh, secret. Uh, so any IRAP assessments and, and cloud service providers, uh, there's multiple layers to those assessments where you'll look at the cloud service provider, you'll look at the, the, um, the, uh, the software provider that might be on top of a cloud service provider, and then you'll also look at uh, the agency uh, dimension as well. Um, so that'd be worth a review if you're not familiar with that one. Uh, one last question, and then we'll let people get back on with their day. There's a question here. Are other COA agencies going to look at utilising DISP for their own purposes, or is there any knowledge of other agencies incorporating their own similar membership? Has anyone uh, got a grasp on, on, on that question? I would say probably no, based on the changes to the security of critical infrastructure legislation. So that introduced what was it, 12 additional sectors of the economy that were going to be uh, defined as critical infrastructure uh, and home affairs is the sector regulator for all of those uh, sectors outside of defence. So uh, the understanding currently is that uh, DISA will be the sector regulator for want of a better expression uh, and the way they will manage that regulation is through DISP. Uh, home affairs has its own uh, regulatory requirements around the uh, mostly around cyber but things like the so the positive security obligation um and then if you're a critical infrastructure entity or you yeah so critical infrastructure entity you've got additional requirements around cyber and then if you're a system you own a system of national significance uh then you've got the enhanced cyber security obligation so uh generally no the those additional sectors of the economy that are now uh, embraced by the definition the broadened definition of critical infrastructure will be regulated by Home Affairs and, and their SOCI framework uh, and Defence will be the, the regulator for Defence. That's it. There's a, there's a lot of uh, different uh, government assurance programs uh, that are out there that have uh, different requirements. Um, but uh, certainly anything based on ISO 27001 can get you a, a a good uh, act as a good platform and starting point. Uh, so uh, there may be more questions. If there is, feel free to send them through to, to, to me or um, any, anyone you know at Six Clicks and we can funnel them out to the panel members or anyone else that we might need to help answer them. I would like to give people the opportunity to resume their day. So thanks for joining us today for this webinar on better managing your defense industry security program using technology. Hopefully you've already moving towards tools and partners to help you with your journey. If it wasn't already obvious, this webinar was brought to you by Six Clicks. A thanks and appreciation goes out to Aaron Pollard from CyberCX and to Cheyenne Shabir from Nova Systems for joining me on the panel. Check us out at sixclicks.com and get in touch with our partners as well. Have a nice day and thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks everybody.